We often wonder what will happen to our quilts. We make them for others to be wrapped in warmth and love. But people grow up, people move away, and people pass on. And we're left wondering, what happened to that quilt I made? Today's guest, Hannah Kelly, has built a business, Stitched and Found, on finding those quilts and selling them on. I had so many questions for her, like how she got started, where do they come from, and how many had labels on them, plus many more. And she graciously answered all of them. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea, and here is my interview with Hannah Kelly. So welcome, Hannah, to the show. Whereabouts in the world are you coming to us from? We live in Nashville, Tennessee, here in Middle Tennessee. When I think of Nashville, I think of music. Are you involved in music at all? Zero percent. <laughs> Zero percent. Um, but that is technically what brought us to Nashville. My husband got a degree in like music production, but quickly learned once he got here that that's probably um, not the best bet, just overly saturated market. But I mean, it all worked out. So are you a quilter? No, I um, am not a quilter. I actually can't even like sew a button on. So how did you get into the business of buying and selling quilts? I mean, growing up in the South, I mean, quilts have always been a part of like our day-to-day -day life. I walk in my mom's house. I mean, there's quilts hanging on the wall. There's quilts on the beds. I remember growing up, my grandmother would keep us because she like, you know, lived on the same road as us. And so we would, you know, be sitting there watching Scooby-Doo or whatever. And she would be sitting behind us uh, quilting. And she had like the tiniest, most perfect hand stitches. And she actually passed away two weeks ago. So that's kind of... um Sorry. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's good. She was very old and it was time for her to go, but I mean, it's still sad. Um, and she gifted each one of her um, grandchildren, which how many, like 10 grandchildren, I don't remember, um, a quilt when they got married. And so I have that um, displayed. So it was about seven years ago, me and a friend from church, we were noticing just a lot of people were like selling stuff on Instagram. And this was back when Instagram you know, there wasn't stories. It was just one picture out of time. And we just noticed people were selling just stuff. And so we started thrifting. I mean, you know, from little baskets to, I don't even remember all the things we would sell, but I quickly noticed that just quilts were selling better and just, they had a higher margin than like a little basket. So I am a wedding photographer. That's what paid our bills when we were first young, poor, and um, early married. Back when I first started, like 90% of my customers were other photographers. So they were buying quilts for photo props for their sessions for, you know, for newborn pictures or for family pictures outside. And so I could also, you know, like cutter quilts and things that had quite a bit of wear, like they didn't care because, you know, they were sitting people on them anyways. It was almost better if they were already really worn. So they didn't care if they got messed up. So yeah, so it just grew and we slowly transitioned to mainly just selling quilts. And then after a year of, and we were back then we were called the handpicked home. Um, that Instagram is still floating around out there. Um, my friend decided to step aside. She had a bunch of young kids and decided to not keep doing it. And so I turned it into Stitch and found. And so that's when, you know, I built a website and started selling not on Instagram anymore, but through my website. And yeah, it's just grown to what it is today. A few years ago, like was at its prime. I was just so thankful that I got to do this. I mean, I stay home with my three little kids. I make good money doing something from my home in this super, super niche market. It's just like hard to explain because okay. it's kind of a really random job, but. Are your customers people that are buying just one of, or are they people that are buying five and six at a time? I would say most people are buying one. Um, I do have a handful of people that buy very regularly. So I list quilts. So back in the day, I would list every Thursday. I mean, for seven years, every Thursday night, 8 p.m. Central Time, I would list quilts. I guess it's been the past year I've switched to every other week. Inventory's gotten slower and just I have like three little children. Now it's every other Thursday. And so, yeah, I feel like most orders are just one quilt, probably like half to a third are repeat clients or customers and like half is new each week. Do customers ever send you pictures of where they put their quilts? Yes and no. Not that often, actually. Um, I would love for more people to show me. Um, I probably need to ask more on social for people to share because I would love to see 
Um, I people will tag me sometimes, like photographers in sessions they've used them in. That makes me want to ask people because I want to see. So how much do you know about quilts now? Do you buy by pattern? Do you buy by color? Like, do you know Lone Stars from Missouri Stars and Ohio Stars? So since the beginning, I'm almost at 11,000 quilts that I have personally like bought and sold. Um, and that doesn't count probably more than that, that I've like not bought, you know what I mean? Like passed mm -hmm. over. And so just the amount of quilts that I have like physically held in my hands, like, yes, I don't make them. Um, but I feel like I like know them very well, if that makes sense. So, I mean, yes, I know definitely all the main, you know, patterns, but sometimes, I mean, I still have no idea. And I have all the books, you know, the to help identify them. Is there a particular color of quilt that sells mm -hmm. better than another? Yes. So the the quilt that sells the best um, is any quilt that's just, oh, like this. That's one color on white. Um, and then blue on white sells the best. I think any blue quilt sells the best overall. And I feel like it just goes with the style kind of nowadays too, the simpler. Of course, then your main, you know, like double wedding rings sell really well. And like your flower gardens sell really well. Those are kind of the top. But then last year I did some research. I mean, I have a degree in economics and finance and that's what I went to school for. And so I'm also super type A. So I have like so many records of all of this stuff from the past seven years. And so I was just going through everything and I was like, what is the most sold quilt? Um, and I don't think it's because like it's more popular. It's just there's more of them out there. And so that was the nine patch quilt. It was like astronomically more, but it's also just a way simpler quilt to make. So it makes more sense that there's more of them out there. But I just thought that was interesting because I would have never thought that that would be the most sold. You have a variety of quilts in many different conditions. Like some are mm -hmm. very worn, some have uh, holes or marks in them. Yeah. And then you have ones that are almost pristine, mm -hmm. but obviously there's a market for all of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I feel like I try to have different price points because mainly, I mean, you're reaching different people with those different price points. And so someone can't afford a $400 quilt, um, but they can afford an $85 quilt. And so I've tried to always have stuff in all price ranges because I can even definitely see the shift now is like, I feel like people are, you know, being tighter with their money. And so I feel like those middle of the road quilts like aren't really selling as well as the lower end or like even the higher end. Cause I feel like people maybe that could afford the higher end anyways can still afford the higher end. Um, but the middle of the road aren't selling as well lately. When you buy them from your vendors, are you just and they know that you want the quilts. Are you buying them by the pound or do you buy them per or do you just take yeah. a look at every single one and know the condition and then come up with a ballpark price? Yeah, it's individual. We look at each individual quilt. And so most of them will already have prices on them. And then we'll also like um, negotiate them. I paid anywhere from $1 for a quilt, you know, to $300 for a quilt. So because people ask me like, well, you know, like, how do you know, like how much to pay for one? I'm, and it's just, I mean, I can just tell, like I've held so many, I can just look at it and know like, oh, this will sell for this much or this will, you know? And so, yeah. Do these quilts require any special care when they come into your home? I feel like back when I was going to the flea market, I would wash most of them. It's a different point in my life of raising children, but I feel like I would wash most of them. I mean, I remember there were stages where I would wash every single one. Then I slowly gradually like got where, oh, this one smells fine. I'm not going to wash it. And so I just gradually, and now I probably wash like one every three months or something. So basically now I just wash them if it like smells really bad. And sometimes even if it smells bad and I don't have time to wash it, I'll just write in the thing that like it has an older odor or it, you know, like this is the price for what you get for it smelling, you know, like I won't sell it for as much because, you know, it's been in storage and smells. But also I feel like now the main people that I'm buying from Sometimes they clean them. And so I just feel like when I bring them in that they're fine. But with also your question, I've never had a bed bug infestation or any sort of, I feel like people ask me that. And last week 
I opened one up like over my like desk. I was about to measure it and this huge centipede like fell off onto my desk. It was awful. Um, so I'm surprised actually that doesn't happen more often. Um, <laughs> Would you recommend cleaning these old quilts? Yeah, so um, I have a whole blog post on cleaning them, but I feel like people also have a lot of different um, opinions on how to clean older vintage antique quilts. Um, and so, but my philosophy always has been, if I want to enjoy this quilt and use it, I need it to feel clean and to smell good. And so if that means I need to put it in my washing machine, then that's what I'm personally going to do. So I know that it feels cleaner to me. Um, some people don't want to do that because it might mess it up or something, but I personally would rather be able to use it and feel like it's clean, even if, you know, it busts a few seams. I don't know. People have different opinions on that. So I always put them in my washer on the gentle cycle um, and then sometimes like tumble dry them or like, I mean, obviously hanging them outside is the best, especially for odors and things. You know, I mean, people recommend, um, I know some of the people I buy them from like soak them in the tub for, you know, the hours and hours and hours. And it just depends on how dirty it is. <laughs> Do you ever come across something that should be in a museum? Um, I'm sure I have. That is one part I feel like that I'm not educated on. Like I am, but it's just impossible for me to know. Like I know I see fabrics and I think like, I really think this is from the civil war, but I just have no way of knowing. And so I'm sure I've had some that are really, really old because even like there's reproduction fabrics of the same things. And so it's just, I don't know how anyone knows um, so that kind of takes me into something else that I guess is frustrated the right word. I don't know. So I've, you know, almost sold, I'm like a hundred away from 11,000 quilts. And I would say like, maybe I've had like a hundred that are signed and dated. Really? Know, 11, like they, none of them are signed and dated. None of them. I mean, I'll go months and months and months and months and not have one. That's just frustrating too. It's like, oh, if this quilt, I mean, this quilt is probably very old. Like if people would have just put their names and their dates on them, we would, it would easily know. So, um, but I feel like most quilts a long time ago weren't made. I mean, they were made for everyday use a lot of times. And so they probably didn't think as much about that part of it. But no, anyone I tell that makes quilts, I'm like, you have to put your name on it and the date. Like the date too. The date's important as much as your name. That's the, that's the other funny thing. Like you talked about saying you found fabrics that you were sure were Civil War, but they could have been Civil War fabrics that were made into a quilt 30 years later. Yep. And there's no way of knowing. And I personally have been guilty of not putting a label on quilts for yeah. many, many years because you just didn't think, it, you know, I'm not an artist or whatever. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. Now I religiously <laughs> put yeah. a label on. I mean, my grandmother, they found several quilts in her house and they were like all like very like pink quilts and she like hated the color pink. So they're like, these can't be hers. But we kind of decided they were probably our my great grandmother's that she had redone. But it's like, we have no way of knowing, you know, it's and I, I'll get quilts every now and then that if they are labeled, it'll say, you know, like top done by whoever this date, but then quilted, you know. 30 years later by this person. So, or yeah, quilted and finished. Do you think many of your quilts end up as clothing? Like people use them as cutter quilts and reuse them for something else? I mean, I definitely have people reach out wanting, you know, to turn them into quilt coats, which has become the hot new thing. I feel like a fun thing to make. So yes, I do feel like they turn into that. And then I do have several people that buy from me that turn them into things, but they're, I mean, looking for those cutter quilts, you know, they're making them into pillows or all sorts of different projects. Yeah. Which I think is fun because it gives it a second life when I feel like some people might've just thrown it away or something. So. So you say you keep meticulous records. Do you have a favorite quilt that you've, or a mm -hmm. list of favorite or a top 10 list? Oh goodness. Yes. But. It's hard when there's so many because I'll like think, oh yeah, those are my favorites. But then I'll scroll through my photos and I, there's so many that are amazing. And I feel like most like any like star type quilt, whether like, I don't even know. Cause I feel like stars are hard to name too. Cause I mean, there's so many variations, you know, people just slightly alter them 
but there's just a few that come to mind that are just kind of like broken star type quilts or so I'm a photographer too. So I like really care about pictures. And so I feel like back to how I was growing, like that's what helped me market myself and to kind of stand out was because I like took really nice pictures of these quilts and they stood out on Instagram. And so I have so many photos of all of these quilts. Like I have this huge database. I'll scroll through them sometimes. So each quilt, when I am photographing them, like I take a picture on the chair. That's like my signature thing, this chair that I got from my other grandmother. I like begged her for it. It was just sitting in our house. I'm like, can I please have this yellow chair? And so I've used that like since the beginning. But then when I hang the quilt up to show the whole thing, I always show like, I don't even know what you would call that kind of picture, but it's the quilt. That's the pictures I always post on my Instagram to kind of highlight them. And I mean, it's kind of just like this, like a rectangle of the quilt. So I have albums of just, I mean, 10,000 pictures of just a picture like this. Um, and then I have all the pictures, you know, with my kids with them and ones around my house. And then like each quilt has 20 plus pictures per quilt. It's a lot of pictures. <laughs> well, I'm wanting, I would love to make like some kind of quilt book or coffee table book of all of these images just to like live on. I don't know. It's one of my goals <laughs> to do one day, but that would be very nice. That would be beautiful. Yeah. I did notice that your Instagram feed is absolutely beautiful. What would be your top tip to tell people and how to photograph a quilt well? Mm, so I also have a whole blog post about this. I mean, so the number one thing to get a good picture is make sure you have good lighting. And so, I mean, you don't have to have, I mean, you don't want flashes and everything. Like just try to find a window, natural light, um, you know, take pictures, not on a cloudy day, but on a sunny day. Then the main thing too, I mean, it's just practice. Like you just have to keep, like if you scroll seven years back in my feed, my pictures don't look like this. I mean, it's something you just have to keep practicing at. And so, and ask for people for feedback. I mean, our iPhones take amazing pictures. You don't have to have, I mean, I'm a professional photographer, so I have really nice equipment, but you don't have, you can use your phone. I mean, I use my phone for taking pictures. And so, yeah, I always turn off like overhead lights and lamps because it's a different color cast and yeah, just find good window light. Now you've got three, three small children, right? Yes. None of them are in school? No. You know, four and a half and almost three and one and a half. So <laughs> gold. Star and I'm there. planning on homeschooling them him next year when he starts. So <laughs> so how do they enjoy the quilts? Do they choose favorites? Do they want to keep some? Do they use them for forts? Well, I don't let them play with the ones I'm selling. <laughs> I think they, it's just been a part of their life that they just think this is normal. Oh, one of my friend's kids came over. I mean, this was years ago and I mean, he was younger, so he didn't like fully know what I did. And then I feel like later his mom said, and she, he was just like, oh, I just thought she really, really liked quilts. <laughs> like, cause I mean, he walked up into my bonus room and there's just like a hundred quilts. So not normal. <laughs> They're just super good at like independent play. And so when I'm working and photographing the quilts, they're just, I mean, playing in my bonus room with me while I work. That's why I do every week, like the Ollie Henry Charlie in the way series on my Instagram stories. And so, because I mean, four years ago when my youngest was crawling around, he was like getting in my pictures and I was like moving him. And I'm like, I don't have time to move him constantly if he's in my picture. So I'm like, He's just going to be in the pictures. And so people have loved it and it makes my job easier. And I like love it. I have all of these pictures of my kids. I just can just see them grow through the pictures. And it's something that I'll always cherish. I have my own photo, like personal photo books of it. And my youngest is a year and a half. I mean, he just thinks he's like hamming it up the whole time. Like he knows when I'm photographing a certain place and he goes and sits because he knows that he's getting his picture made. And so I don't know. It's fun for me that they get to do it with me. This may seem a little bit out of order, but it's just come to mind. So yeah. you've been on this journey of buying quilts. Did you have a mentor that helped advise you on what quilts were the value of the quilts? Or was that something that you just learned as you went along? Yeah, definitely something I just learned as I went along. I mean, I guess I could tell I knew which ones, oh, this is a way better quilt. But I mean, I look back in the early days of some quilts that I sold. I mean, my sister like had this random yellow double wedding ring quilt I mean this was probably back like 2016 or something um that she was ready to like change out of her house for something different and so I like sold it and I mean I sold it for like 
probably like $85 or something. And now I would list, I mean, I have one probably just like it for 300 on my website. And so, I mean, I can definitely look back and know that I sold things for way less than they were worth. I mean, even now I'm selling quilts for less than they're worth. Like it's all dependent on who your market is and who, I mean, the same person somewhere else could sell some of these quilts for thousands of dollars. You know, it's just the market that you have. I mean, cause you could look on eBay or somewhere and there's a quilt similar to I have that's $5,000. And so it's just something's just worth whatever someone's willing to pay for it. So personally, like these are worth way more than what I sell them for. Like, I mean, they're so old and so much work. I mean, the fabric costs more than, you know, what you sell them for. So <laughs> so you mentioned that there was this big market in Nashville. Were you ever able to get out to bigger markets or buy from farther afield? Or is this all local that you've purchased from? Um, so yeah, all of my people are just local. I have had a few, I mean, there will be random times people will contact me. Um, I mean, I've had people in Connecticut reach out, clear, you know, that work for state sale companies, clearing out a house that I've bought tons from, you know, just random things like that, mainly just here. And I mean, and some of my vendors here branch out when they're looking for them. So you're in Tennessee. Is there a Tennessee flavor to quilts? Can you tell when something's from farther afield? No, I don't ever feel like I can tell like regions that a quilt's from. I feel like it's just more like eras like oh this is definitely like great depression or this is the 80s you know so and I would almost say they're the same all over the country in that regard just because you're in Nashville I'm thinking of Dolly Parton's song of the multicolored coat that she used to wear mm -hmm. can you tell when you've got an Appalachian quilt versus a coastal quilt or like is there I'm talking more about the the economic um, situation people came from can you can tell that they were dirt poor or Obviously, the, the very wealthy, you can tell that. But I'm more interested in those those Appalachian quilts. Yeah, I definitely feel like, you know, those are the ones that are just way scrappier and like not. But I feel like they still like always are still beautiful. Like they still do a design, even if they're using fabrics from all sorts of different things. Or there's definitely a level of like, oh, this is a very nice someone had money to be able to make this and make it so nice. But then I feel like, you know, say you're, you know, poor family making a quilt, like they still put the time and care into making it. And so, I mean, it's still like pieced really well. The quilting's still immaculate. Like, I don't know. Um, does that make sense? Yep. They're making do with what they have. Yeah. Cause I feel like I've heard too, a lot of times, like, you know, if the backing is like, not just plain, you know, like solid white or feed sack or something, then like they're more affluent, spent money on the backing too. <laughs> have you found quilts that have been quilted over top of other quilts? Yeah, not very often. Or I feel like it's more just some like random, not like a quilt inside, but just like some kind of just thick, like comforter type something. And some, I mean, sometimes they're just really thick. There's no telling what's inside of it. I'm not peeking inside to see. <laughs> I, I was, I interviewed a woman last week and she said her mother gave her a quilt that had everything inside it. So much that she and her partner called it the dead body. Like she said, if you laid under it, you'd actually have to psych yourself up to get out from underneath it. It was a planned exit. You couldn't just flip it over. <laughs> I guess I don't know. Like, why did people quilt over them? Well, from my research, the backing and the batting was more expensive. Like that was a, something that was mm -hmm. different because you would have to have a sheet and then mm -hmm. the batting itself would be something. So mm -hmm. a lot of people had lots of quilt tops mm -hmm. because they could use their scraps for that. But to take it to the extra step was more work. So if they already yeah. had an old quilt mm -hmm. and they could quilt over it, that, that would solve yeah. the problem. Yeah. But I've also met people who didn't use cotton batting they used wool socks mm -hmm. like old wool socks that had been yeah. worn through the the foot and things mm -hmm. like that so mm -hmm. have you found any unusual things inside not anything like that I don't think I mean just you know there will be old newspapers and things from paper piecing so when people come into your home and they see their all the quilts that you have what is their reaction all of them are like up in my bonus room. So I feel like anyone that's making their way all the way up there knows what I do. 
You know what I mean? So, I mean, if it's like a random maintenance worker or something, I feel like they're just, they don't even say anything because they're probably just, who is this crazy lady? (laughs) Do you worry about people touching your quilts? I don't. They come and go so quickly. I don't know. I feel like, I mean, most time they're just in my house for like a week or two. And so there's never much time for something to happen. Like the kids know they don't, I mean, the stacks are pretty large. And so they don't like get on them. And then, yeah, and we have a dog too. And I just, I mean, I keep her out. Like, I don't let her get on them or anything, but um, yeah. You say that you post these every other week. Is there like a record time that something has disappeared Mm -hmm. in? Like, do you find people are, are waiting for that, that moment when you post and people take them away right away? Yes. (laughs) So I post them right, you know, 8 p.m. Central time every other Thursday, Um, And I always put in my profile, like the date. So if you're ever wondering. So yeah, so what I do is I list them on my website on Wednesday with my cart deactivated so that people can preview them. Because a long time ago, I would just like, here they are. And everyone's like wanting to buy quickly, but they're like, I haven't even like really looked at it. And so I didn't want people to be spending this much money kind of on an uneducated purchase. Because like, you need to look through the photos, like look at, I mean, every quilt has some sort of air, you know, like. There's not many that I sell that don't have some kind of small stain or some small, you know, loose seam something. And so, so I list them on Wednesdays and you can preview them, look through them. And then on Thursday, it goes live. And yes, like there will will always be several that are instantly gone. And then I get people mad and upset because they didn't get the one they wanted. Um, I mean, this happens every week. And so... I mean, I always tell people, I mean, I hate it. Like you want everyone to have the one they wanted, but I'm selling like one of a kind things. And so everyone can't have the one that they wanted. And so basically, I I mean, I just tell people like, it's really just to have the fastest internet and like the fastest fingers, because there are always some that are instantly gone and people get mad about that. And then people are always mad too. Like they just want me to list them like random times and like rant, like, oh, you have them ready. Like just list them. But I always, I'm like, this is the way I've done it for seven years. I'm not changing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it, like, I want, yeah, I want people to make an educated purchase too. What's the longest that you've held on to a quilt? Um, so sometimes I'll look back through my inventory because sometimes, you know, the weeks just like build into weeks and months and you're like, oh, I haven't even looked at my inventory to like see if I need to drop some prices on things. And so I'll like look back and I mean, there'll be some probably sometimes there'll be like eight months, like a year, but it'll just be like one or two. And they're like not good ones. You know, they're ones that I mean, then I end up dropping the price to like what I paid or less just so they move on probably like half or three fourths sell like that week wow and over the next month like the rest kind of sell so you mentioned that you have some people that buy repeat repeatedly do you know if anybody are from like the National Quilt Museum or the New England Quilt Museum or the Texas Museum no I have um no idea who these people are I only know one person I'm not going to mention who they are for a long time they bought a lot of quilts like I'll look back because like when I ship an order you know I can see like how many they've bought and and I like recognize names because you know they buy so often and I just like really like sometimes want to email them and be like what are you using these for but it feels weird to ask but I also like really want to know but yeah I mean I'll be watching you know a random movie or tv show and see a quilt in it and I just wonder I mean like I recognize it but also like I don't like recognize it, recognize it. And I'm just like, what if that was one of my quilts that someone bought? So I guess this is the, if you're watching and buy my quilts and you use them for cool things, like tell people, tell me, tell, um, or other things that you buy from other people, if you're using it, like tell them what you do, because they want to know. Do you find like lots of different uh, techniques? I just interviewed Pamela Weeks from the New England Quilt Museum, and she's a collector of potholder quilts. Do you get many of those like pot holders or quilt as you go or the signature quilts? Those type quilts, I feel like are always super heavy. It's kind of like, you know, like your cathedral window, like, cause each block is its own thing. Anyways, I don't feel like I've had many of those. Oh, like, so, I mean, signature quilts is semi-common. I've had some really fascinating ones, you know, that it's like random churches, Sunday school class, like made some quilt or, you know, high school reunion type quilts or... Um, I have one actually listed on my website right now. I don't think it's sold, um, but it just has like the sweetest older names. Like it is so sweet. And they're like written, like really nice. I've seen a lot of signature signature quilts and it's done really well. But I feel like a lot of times people don't like buying those because it's like, who are these random names on this quilt, which I understand. Yeah, I don't know about the quilt. I feel like some of those I might not 
like it would take further like inspection. I feel like sometimes, you know, sometimes different people like you, they would have a quilt, like they would all quilt on the same quilt together. You would have to really examine some of those to be able to see it, which is also a negative of selling so many. It's like they all start to run together as well. (laughs) Uh, Blur together. So you are a photographer and you do an excellent job of in Instagram, making all your quilts look beautiful. Do you Mm -hmm. photograph for other quilters? So yeah, so I've started doing that some more lately. Um, I actually have a box of two separate people right now that I'm photographing. Yeah, so I have kind of two different brackets in um, the way I do that. So, you know, the cheaper option is I just photograph them here in my home. I have kind of three different setups and I do like the large flat lay, you know, on white you know, for their cover photo, for their patterns or whatever. And so, you know, that's easy and cheaper, but also like your pictures could look like other people's pictures because it's in the same settings. But then there's also a tier where, you know, I rent a space here in Nashville and we go into a different home and take them for, you know, whatever release you're having of your new pattern. And so, yeah, but I like love doing that. And I just feel like, I mean, I feel like I do a good job photographing them. So um, you can definitely put quilt photographer on your resume. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Thank you so much for being on the show. Um, If people want to get a hold of you, how can they reach you? Yeah. So, I mean, my website is easy stitch and found.com and then Instagram. um, Those are the two places I mainly spend my time. So my Instagram stitch and found as well. Do Do you do a newsletter? I have an email list, (laughs) but I mainly, I just send one email every other week on Thursdays when new quilts are listed. Thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Interesting, (laughs) interesting work that you do. And thank you for sharing with everyone. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Hannah Kelly. I was so impressed on how she built her business and how she has pivoted and adjusted as her life has changed. If you are interested in her website or her services as a quilt photographer, I will leave all her links in the description notes below, including the link to the blog post, Six Quilt Photography Tips from an Expert. And don't forget to put a label on your quilt. If you are unsure of how to make a label, I have a video about various techniques and I'll leave a link to that video right here. Next time you're in your sewing room, be sure to have Karen's Quilt Circle playing on in the background. I have interviewed so many interesting people on this series. Let one inspire you. And now you can listen to this podcast on the YouTube Music app. And also check out last week's video here too. Take care and I'll see you next time.